Hey everybody, it's Kat Neville. I am the publisher of Feast Magazine uh, in St. Louis and I am connecting with you from my living room. This is the third installment of our happy half hour with our friends over at Luxco. And um, I'm really excited to connect with Dustin Paris again. He is just an incredibly talented bartender and he's got three really unique and uh, fun cocktails to share with us. We're gonna be wrapping up with a martini, which will be really, really delicious. So I'm kind of, up. Oh, here we go. There's Ezra Brooks. Hold on one sec, I'm gonna get, there we go. Hey Dustin. We have some really fun stuff on tap today, including rye whiskey and uh, some, hey Dustin, how are you? Doing well, Kat, how are you? I'm terrific, I can't believe this is our last one. I'm kind of sad oh, about it. It's been such a long week waiting for this, and I don't know what I'm going to do next week. Uh, I'll really miss this. This has been a lot of fun. I know. It really has been a lot of fun. I feel like we've kind of gotten to know each other through these happy hours, which, honestly, that's how a lot of people get to know each other is over a good cocktail. Right. Cocktail. Bring you <laughs> together since the dawn of time. That's right. So, so what is our first weekend today? Go? Go ahead. We're doing um, the uh, the Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey first. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. We you should always start with Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, and at Lux Road Distillers, we make a number of them. Ezra Brooks being one of my absolute favorites uh, because we don't water it down. It keeps at an honest ninety proof, uh, so you can really taste all the flavors. Uh, we're gonna do a rye bourbon. And then I'm actually going to pour you some Ezra Brooks rye after that. So Perfect. there's about 10% rye in this mash bill, and we do over 50% rye in my next mash bill. But um, summer's coming. and <laughs> Eventually, days, you wouldn't know it from the weather outside. You know, it's been about <laughs> 60 degrees and gray uh, every time I look out my window right now. But it's all right. I've been able to get a lot of yard work done, so I'm mm -hmm. happy. But uh, the, the blackberry season is always one of my favorites. And so I want to bring in one of my favorite patio cocktails. You know, I, I've built a career on introducing people to new things. And I've always said I don't believe in people that don't like whiskey. I only believe in people that don't know how much they like whiskey yet. So <laughs> this next cocktail is one of my all-time greatest gateway drugs. All right. We're going to start with some blackberries, some Ezra Brooks, and a little lemonade, sugar, bring it all home. Nice. So, so, you know, you're using blackberries, but if somebody doesn't have blackberries, do you want something that's really tart like a blackberry, or you look, could you use something like a strawberry? Like what, what are some other fruits that people could use in this type of a drink? There, there's no such thing as a bad berry, right? If you go, I really love strawberries, then you know what? You could probably find a home for it in this drink. Now, the blackberry and the rye in this bourbon come together really well. If you move towards some of those sweeter berries, you might want some of those sweeter bourbons. Mm. And Lux Pro's got you covered on that as well. We make a lot of weeded bourbons, Rebel Yell, David Nicholson, 1843, and Mullen. Um, but yeah, if you, I like the tart and the spice that we're gonna get out of this drink. But if, you, if you're like, no blueberries or strawberries are my jam, then a strawberry lemonade with a Rebel Yell would be fantastic. Okay, perfect. Good advice. Typically, I have sugar cubes, but, you know, we're dealing with limited resources these days. So <laughs> I have some regular table sugar, which is perfectly acceptable. Uh, one sugar cube, which is what I would normally use, is about a teaspoon of sugar. So there's a teaspoon of sugar in there. You can so, make it. Dustin, I have a question for you. So rather, why are you using sugar rather than simple syrup? I was actually just about to tell you about that. That's fantastic. <laughs> so sugar versus simple syrup is, is a big deal for me, okay? Because simple syrup and sugar have the same flavor and caloric value, and so you think that they're equals. But whenever I'm about to introduce this muddler into the equation, of this sugar and blackberry right here, 
that sugar is going to be a very natural exfoliant. It's going to help me bring out the, the oils and the flavors of the blackberry. If I use simple syrup where all the sugar is already diluted and there's nothing abrasive going on, I really just end up with smashed blackberries. But what we're really going to do right now is pull all the flavors of these blackberries out using a natural sugar. Cool. So that is a great question. And what's funny about this cocktail, too, is there are so many different great ways to make it. You know, whenever I'm just making one for me or the missus, this is exactly the way to go. Couple blackberries, a little bit of sugar, you know, you, then you have a drink and you're good to go. If and just I, a pint glass. Now, I actually was making a cocktail the other day and I found myself without a muddler. I don't have a muddler. So I used my reamer. Is, what, what can somebody who doesn't have a muddler use to kind of get the same effect? Wooden kitchen spoons, uh, the back end of your hammer, uh, I mean, <laughs> it, anything that's flat and, and will fit inside of that glass. You know, it's about this much diameter to work with. If it's smaller than this and has a flat edge, you'll be all right. Uh, I mean, you're really just, just putting a smash on something. So it works out pretty well. Um, so I've got my model going, but I did want to mention whenever I make this drink, if I know it's, it's game night over here or there's people coming over, you know, I, I, we still remember when that happened, but whenever that was going on and I knew I'd make a few of these, you can actually batch a blackberry simple syrup. So then that way, which you would do with raw sugar and blackberries, so okay. you still get this exfoliant, but then I would add that sugar. Uh, and then boil that down, concentrate that. And then if you have about eight ounces of this sitting on the side, you can do a half ounce of blackberry simple syrup, you know, or an ounce or a quarter ounce, however you like your drink. You know, I, I always write down my specs, but make them the way you like them. That's the important part. We have a question. Um, one of the folks, the, the, the wonderful people from uh, We Eat Stuff asked a question. Uh, if you were to add a little bit of salt, would that help to bring out the flavor? Would you recommend adding some salt to a cocktail like this? I would. Uh, if, it, if it's something that, that you like, then 100%. Charlie, that's a great question. Um, and it is the salt. Salt is always a flavor enhancer. Too much salt takes you a little outside of the realm, but uh, there's no, I like making shrubs, mm -hmm. you know? make a blackberry shrub which is really then just some vinegar and salt and, and some blackberries kind of it's the antithesis to a blackberry simple tip syrup mm -hmm. you could do either of those and and really create that flavor profile that you want but i promise you if you put a pinch of salt in that if you like that salty tang it's going to hit you right here and you'll love it nice but oops, there you go my ice scoop got frozen <laughs> There you go. That's right. <laughs> well, and I'm glad that you brought up shrubs because, you know, they obviously have made a real resurgence um, recently, and they're great with alcoholic cocktails. Um, they're great if you, like, if you have kids and you want to just make them a sparkling, you know, drink while you're having something, if they're really versatile. Is there one that you would recommend that if people don't feel like making one at home that they could get their hands on? Um, as store-bought shrubs, yeah. not, you know, I'm actually unfamiliar. My, my best advice, and, you know, if you've got a good craving for a good shrub, go sit down at Retreat Grass Gastro Pub and let Tim Wiggins do the work for you. <laughs> His pineapple sage shrub that oh, he yeah. put in a little bit of champagne is absolutely one of the best drinks I've ever had. And I highly recommend you ask him to put a shot of Ezra Brooks in that for you. Nice. Oh, that's very good advice. But yeah, if you're in St. Louis and you're and you're chosen for a shrub and don't want to do the work yourself, Tim Wiggins has you covered at any of his restaurants. He does very good work. Awesome. Excuse me, I'm going to be real loud for one second. All right. So I think I talked over the part where I said we put about two ounces of Ezra Brooks in here. All right, so it was three to four blackberries, tablespoon of sugar or a sugar cube, uh, and then two ounces of whiskey. Now I'm going to fill my glass with ice. 
and then I'll be done being loud for this drink. But <laughs> now I need to strain this out. I'm going to use two strainers because we put blackberries in here. And blackberries have a lot of seeds, which is something I didn't know until I was about 15 years old because I had an aunt who would grow an acre of seedless blackberries every year. So my entire childhood, every blackberry cobbler I ever ate, which was a lot, had no seeds in it. Oh, wow. And yeah, imagine my surprise when I, when I started, you know, socially eating cobbler and someone invites me to have a slice of their blackberry cobbler <laughs> and I go, who put sand in your cobbler? What's going on here? So blackberry seeds and I do not get along. I grew Got up it. loving the flavor of blackberries, but not the texture of those seeds. So my tea strainer is going to take care of that for me. And we're going to take all those sandy seeds out of the equation. So when a cocktail recipe calls for double straining, that's what you're doing right now, right? Correct. You would call this a double strain. And, you know, my cocktail strainer here is keeping the ice and all the, all the other trash out of the glass. But anytime you're muddling leaves or something seedy like a blackberry, you should always consider using a double strainer. Uh, because again, if you're out in public drinking these and, and you decide that you want to go talk to the pretty girl across the bar or anything like that, you want to make sure that, that your dental work's looking pretty good. You don't want to have <laughs> mint leaves from your mojito or blackberry seeds from your lemonade you know, clogging up your game. There's a reason we go out to box. It's so we can meet more people. That's so, right. But so here's my two ounces of Ezra Blackberry infused Ezra Brooks fine strain. You see, there's still plenty, plenty of seeds and stuff in here. Mm -hmm. uh, but now in order to finish this cocktail, I'm just going to top it with some, I actually hand squeezed this lemonade. Of course you did. You see, the size of this lemon, but uh, <laughs> pretty sure it was a softball in a past life. Nice. So, uh, the, the amount of, I bought a couple of lemons thinking I could use them for this, that, and again, I got footballs. So figured why not make some fresh lemonade for you guys. So this would be a Ezra Brooks blackberry lemonade, perfect for summer. You're gonna be able to go blackberry picking here pretty soon. Um, this is a, just a nice skewer put on top of that. This is a fantastic summer drink. And I love it. We're home. And put a little salt in it. It'll really make it pop. Awesome. Dustin, how fun. I love that. The next one that you're making is much more simple. And this one's using a rye. Absolutely. Rye whiskey. I love our rye. It is nice and spicy. Uh, but it also has a really lovely sweetness to it. Um, our bourbon with our rye is spicier than most bourbons, mm -hmm. but our rye is actually sweeter than most ryes. And I'm going to talk about why, because we do that on purpose. Uh, let me let me switch scripts real quick. <laughs> this is great. Out with the old, in with the new. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. The value of these videos is fantastic. Um, so yeah, our rye. Our mm -hmm. rye is actually a 51% rye mash bill, okay? By law, you must be at least 51% uh, rye to put the word straight rye whiskey on your label, right? Now, there are some ryes that the most common rye mash bill would be a, what you call a 95.5, 95% rye, 5% malted barley. Malted okay. barley is not a flavor additive, it is a production value additive. Barley makes more alcohol faster. So as a distiller, you go, throw 5% rye in there, boom, we increase our yield, we decrease our time, we're making money. When you see 100% rye mash bills, that is a labor of love. Oh, wow. A very passionate uh, distiller, because you can really, if you mess up your distillation temperatures on 100% rye, you make cement. And the only way to clean out pipes of cement is to throw them away and put in new pipes. That can be wow. Nice. So, so uh, what I think is really interesting in kind of the past three weeks that we've been doing this is that 
you know, I always think of gin, for example, as having a really broad um, kind of like flavor experience because of the botanicals. But truly, under the umbrella of whiskey, I mean, this could not be more different from the whiskey that we just tasted that also has a good dose of rye in it. You know, and, and each one that you have presented over the past three weeks has its own really distinct character, even though they're all whiskeys. They're, they're all whiskeys. And I mean, the word whiskey in and of itself defines a spirit that has touched oak. If you, if you distill it and it touches a pe uh, an oak board as it comes out of the still, boom, you can call that whiskey. Hmm. Now, American whiskey obviously made here, but then bourbons and ryes have the biggest, uh, there are more laws, rules, and regulations you have to follow to make bourbon than any other spirit. They're the largest classified spirits out there. So people think that there's not a lot of flavor variations between this bottle or that bottle because of those laws. But distillers and barrel makers and, you know, blenders, they spend all this time and energy really creating something unique. So that way, whenever you see the name Ezra Brooks, you know you're getting a unique flavor experience, whether it's with our bourbons, our rice, or anything you make. You have to forgive me, Dustin. I'm an editor. So I g grabbed on to you said any spirit that sees oak, but there are obviously oak aged um, tequilas and oak aged gin. So can you explain what really distinguishes the, I mean, would those be considered whiskeys? Like what's the technical? If you, if you wanted to take your tequila that you painstakingly grew an agave for seven years and then made it 100% an agave spirit and you did it in a region where you're allowed to put the word tequila on your label and you followed all those rules of tequila, all right, and then you aged it in oak for three to nine months so you could put the word reposado on it. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to sell that as whiskey, you could, you could say, here's some Mexican whiskey for you. Huh. I don't think there's a big market for that. I think there's <laughs> a right. big market for aged 100% agave tequilas. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you, if you wanted to make your own label and just say, we sell Mexican whiskey, not tequila, they could be the exact same thing. That's interesting. Um, whiskey, the, that word whiskey is a very broad term. Um, tequila is a very specific term, and that's what the consumers want. So okay. there's, there's not a value to taking 100% agave tequila off of there and putting the word whiskey on there. Yeah, you know? that's really interesting. I mean, because, I mean, truly as a consumer, when you're looking at it, how do you pick? And that's why reading the label to understand what does rye taste like, what makes something a bourbon, you know, with on, under the, the class of whiskey. I know we're getting off topic and you're about to make a cocktail, but I was just really curious about that. Uh, but, and I mean, that's why bourbon is so specific. That's why they go out of their way to always promise that it's a first use barrel, that it's at least 51% corn, that it's at least two years old, and, and that they've done all these things because as a consumer, when you walk into a liquor store these days, there's too many options, all right? And we all have a cell phone that you can Google anything. So you have to be transparent these days. You have to be honest. You have to put it all out there. But if you see the word bourbon on a label, that's mm -hmm. a guarantee that it's done a, a checklist of things. And you should feel comfortable trying that. Yeah. You know, some bourbons have higher price tags than others. So you might not feel comfortable buying a $90 bottle you've never had before. But when you see Ezra Brooks sitting on the shelf for you know under twenty dollars you can say oh that still says kentucky straight bourbon whiskey i love kentucky straight bourbon whiskey i feel comfortable bringing this one home and giving it a whirl so Got it. that's awesome and then um casey weighed in with the question uh what about beers that are aged in oak barrels i think that the designation only applies to spirits right correct beers yeah. are not distilled spirits those are fermented alcohols um, and so I, I love beers aged in, in oak barrels, especially ex bourbon casks. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there, there is a difference between fermentation and distillation. You have to ferment before you can distill, but 
Yeah, if you don't distill it, you're actually not a spirit. You're just an alcoholic beverage, uh, which is strange that there is that classification. So I'm going to do a few ounces of my rye, and I'm going to top it with some ginger beer. All right. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad ginger beer. If it's the ginger beer you like, then use it. I am particular to Gosling, um, but I enjoy it very much. Tap that right in there. And then, oh, I, for, I forgot to make my copper mug joke. You have to have a copper mug to make a mule, but uh, this, is, this is the only copper mug I have. It's about one ounce. So. <laughs> but, not uh, big enough. Yeah, not big enough. I, I like a real drink. So, I mean, honestly and truly, this is what it takes to make a mule. Right? Mules were actually uh, invented by an ad agency in the 50s. Uh, we needed to sell more vodka in this country. And so somebody decided, let's make a real easy drink, but put it in a really cool cup. And, you know, back in the 50s, they would just use pure copper, uh, which explains why so many, why lockjaw used to be such a thing. But uh, uh, alcohol is always absorbing. And so if you fill a actual copper cup with alcohol, you will start to pull that copper out of out of the mug and into the drink. And then that starts getting in your blood. And I mean, I just watched Iron Man too. You don't want different metals and stuff in your blood. That's, that's not good. <laughs> but that's why most, that's why all mugs made these days are copper plated on the outside. There's no copper coloring on the inside of that, if you can see. I mean, we, we just don't drink out of copper cups anymore. It's 2020. We know that. Or lead. Yeah. Roll the dice. <laughs> Unlike the Romans. <laughs> uh, but sure, the, so that looks delicious. Yeah. The, the spice of the rye and the spice of the ginger beer really, really complement each other. Um, you, you see a lot of these drinks. They're typically made with 80 proof whiskeys, which is why they have a bad name. If you have a 90 proof whiskey, I promise you, you'll actually know that there's alcohol in there uh, and you really get to start tasting the flavors, which is why I love that Ezra Brooks is such a great affordable option for simple cocktails like this. It doesn't hide, it shines through. Yeah. Well, and I can say, I mean, I've just been drinking it um, just so that I could really get the flavor and the aroma. I'm drinking it like room temperature out of the glass. It's delicious. That's, and, and you know, there's That's the true no wrong way to drink your spirits, but that is a very right way to drink <laughs> in, my opinion, so. in fact, it's been, it's been so long since I've had this ride. I think I'll, I'll join you. You're going to join me? Awesome. Yeah, again, I'm really going to miss you next week. This I is know, I know. Cheers. Mm. <clears throat> okay. I'm prepared with my shaker for our next cocktail. Ooh, you're going to play with me, huh? Yep. I love it. Oh, he disappeared. This is another set change that we have going on. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> so, and we're going to switch gears entirely. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to pour some clear spirits. I got a great bottle of pearl vodka. Pearl vodka is distilled from red winter Canadian wheat, uh, and then we bring it down to St. Louis, Missouri in tanker trucks where it's about 190 proof, and then we'll actually rectify it here. Uh, rectify means bring down the proof. We do 80 proof for our regular, 70 proof for our flavors. We'll actually flavor it here, we'll bottle it here, and then it goes all across the globe right here from St. Louis, Missouri. I love that. There's about 350 St. Louisans that work there every week, and we love that. That's great. And I have to tell you, I mean, I already poured the two ounces or two and a half ounces of the, um, the pearl cucumber vodka. It's already in here. It smells exactly like I would have sliced open a cucumber. It's pretty amazing how that works. Uh, John Rempe is, again, he... He is our, currently our head distiller at Lux Row Distillers. He's distilling all our whiskey. But before we built that distillery and he moved into that role, he was actually uh, here in St. Louis creating all of these flavors. So any flavor of pearl you've ever tried, John Rempe, who again, did a lot of great work with Coca-Cola before he joined us, uh, he put all of these flavors together for us. Well, cheers to him. Um, we appreciate his work. 
We are making martinis, so excuse me. It includes lime, which is why I have this. Uh, we are making martinis, so we are going to do an extra pour today. My neighbor decided to cut their grass. Sorry is that, that what that is? Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll do two and a half ounces of vodka. Mm -hmm. so there's two, and there's your half. Uh, and then we're going to, I always forget something. I forgot my knife. You forget yeah. your reamer? Oh, there, I do have my reamer. <laughs> um, I just need my knife. So yeah, instead of using packaged lime juice, which you can or anything like that, uh, I always enjoy using fresh squeeze when I can. Yeah. So I'm going to put it right into our jigger right here and ream out a half ounce of fresh lime. So, and if you got a, if you got a half a lime, then that'll get you about a half an ounce. So there it is. Oh, I love lime. So we'll do that, pour that right in top. And then I use a white cranberry juice for this drink, all right? So this is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a Cosmo, but uh, with the cucumber and all that, I actually call this a moment of zen. Uh, and I find it, it's very relaxing. Uh, if you make this <laughs> drink and enjoy it out on the patio, so. You ready? Let's do it. So, Dustin, can you talk about the difference between shaking on ice and a dry shake and why you would choose one versus the dry other? Dry shake. Dry shakes are very, very fun. Uh, you want to use them whenever you're building. Oh, look at that. Uh, you want to use them whenever you're building body into a cocktail. All right. Um, pineapple juice and egg whites being among the, the two best things to help build that body inside. Uh, you dry shake a cocktail with a little egg white when you're making a nice traditional sour, uh, and that agitation foams that egg white and puts that big frothy layer on top, mm. gives it that velvety viscosity that just hits your tongue so nice. Uh, I'm really, really into a good dry shake goes a long way. But yeah, pineapple juice and egg white are two of your best friends for that. Yum. Oh, yum, Dustin. That's so good. I mean, talk about refreshing. Once it actually yeah. feels like summer outside, I mean, it's Memorial Day this weekend. It's the official start of summer. This should be your cocktail. It, it is summer. Um, and yeah, whether you're drinking blackberry lemonades or cucumber martinis, uh, you can't go wrong. And it is cucumber season for sure. There's nothing wrong with muddling some fresh cucumber into this. Uh, I have even... You know, go to your herb garden, a little mint, a little basil, mm -hmm. whatever you've got laying around. Make these drinks your own. You know, th these are a lot of fun. And I, I make drinks thinking, what if I had to make 100 of these in an hour because the dining room's full? You know, but if you're making drinks just for you, don't be afraid to play a little jazz. Make it your own drink. No, this is great. And I love how, tar I love, I love the, the play of kind of that, herbaceous uh, cucumber against the tart floral lime. That's really, really nice. Yeah, and that, that cranberry really ties the two together. It's really, really nice. You know, and uh, I, I've had this one out for a minute, but you, you can keep vodka in the freezer. That's always a good place to keep it. Uh, that way, as you shake, you know, you get that mix, you get a little less dilution. Uh, you, however you like your drinks. I don't recommend you put your whiskey in the freezer. That starts shutting down some of the flavors, but vodka in the freezer is pretty tasty. <laughs> so um, we're closing in, believe it or not, on half an hour. So um, all of these recipes are available at feastmagazine.com. And Dustin, I know this is our last happy hour. So if folks want more guidance from you, you're incredibly knowledgeable, which is really made these past three weeks, a lot of fun. And I've learned a ton from you. If people want to find you or learn more about Luxco, how can they do that? Uh, my personal Instagram is about dram time. Uh, it's always dram time at this house, but yes, about underscore dram time. Uh, that's how you can find me on Instagram. 
You can message me. Uh, if you just reach out to Luxco, we are a local St. Louis company. Uh, I am here for you. Uh, and, you know, there's, I love talking about drinks and spirits and booze. So please don't be shy. There's no judgment. I always tell people, as long as you're enjoying your cocktails, you're doing it right. All you uh, need to so. That's awesome. Dustin, thank you for sharing your passion for cocktails with us for the past three weeks. It has been a real pleasure. And I look forward to running into you now that we can actually go out and about again. It's open, baby. <laughs> So, but yes, I, I hope we get the chance to work together again soon. This has truly been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for the industry and everything. Absolutely. Cheers. Dustin, cheers. Bye, everybody. We've enjoyed Goodbye. the past three happy half hours. We'll see you at the bars, guys. <laughs> awesome. <laughs>